Good evening. I'm going to just allow a few other people to come in and find their seats. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for being on time. My name is Eric Kreitler. I'm a partner at the law firm Morgan Lewis & Bacchus, and I'm honored to serve as the chair of the board of directors of the Committee of 70. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our 118th anniversary event, Investing in Democracy, Patriotic Philanthropy, and the Business Case for Civic Participation. I want to begin by thanking our featured speaker tonight, David Rubenstein, and moderator Ali Velshi, our many sponsors and supporters, and in particular, our presenting sponsor, Brandywine Realty Trust. I want to thank our fantastic board, now 66 members strong, our wonderful CEO, Al Schmidt, and our amazing staff, and in particular, our Chief Program Officer, Lauren Christella, who brings positive energy to everything she does and is largely responsible for the success of tonight's event. This National Constitution Center is a beautiful setting for tonight's event, but it's also a meaningful uh, setting for this event. 235 years ago, patriots gathered a few blocks from here, and they signed a constitution that began with the words, we the people, thereby echoing the novel idea in our Declaration of Independence that governments derive their power from the consent of the governed. One of those patriots was Benjamin Franklin. And as the story is told, after signing the Constitution, he exited from Independence Hall, and someone in the crowd outside yelled out, Doctor, do we have a republic or a monarchy? And he responded ominously, a republic if you can keep it. And so being in this Constitution Center reminds us what American democracy means. It reminds us of the value of American democracy. And it reminds us of the hard work and the constant work that is necessary to keep it. The Committee of 70 is 118 years old. It has existed for fully half of the years since the United States Constitution was signed here in Philadelphia. For all of those years, we've worked for a strong participatory democracy for integrity and effectiveness in government, and indeed, for a more perfect union. This is important work, and it's never been more important. You're going to hear from some heroes tonight, beginning with our CEO, Al Schmidt, who, as a Republican city commissioner in 2020, ran an exemplary vote-counting operation at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. And then, Notwithstanding threats, he bravely ignored those threats and he told the truth about the election here in Philadelphia. Al, thank you for your tremendous leadership and for the incredible visibility you've brought to the Committee of 70 at the state and national levels this year. Obviously, we're also going to hear from David Rubenstein. Who, ha who, through incredible philanthropy, has worked to preserve America's foundational documents and monuments and to tell stories that matter to ensure that we never forget the meaning of the American experiment. And you're going to hear from Ali Velshi a Philadelphian by marriage, a New York television personality who actually lives in his Pennsylvania home. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to thank and welcome a very special group of future leaders that's with us this evening. When our former board member and Philadelphia's great civic leader, Carl Buchholz, died at age 51 in 2016, we sought to honor his memory by establishing the Committee of 70's Buckholz Fellow Program. Our Buckholz Fellows are emerging young leaders who embody the, the, the qualities 
that Carl demonstrated throughout his life. Our Buckholz Fellows sit as non-voting members of our Board of Directors, and they undertake projects that advance 70's mission. We are now on 70, 70's sixth cohort of Fellows, a total of 41 remarkable young men and women. Many of them are here this evening, and I'd like to ask, would all of our fellows please stand and be recognized? A lot of them are in the back. They know where the bar is, and they're, they're ready to, to move. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you a former Buckholz Fellow the Dr Director of Strategic Partnerships at the celebrated Christo Ray Philadelphia High School, Kashima Davidson. Hi everyone, good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Committee of 70, and in particular, Laura and Cristela for this invitation to speak here tonight. You know, when I made the decision to apply to the Buckles Fellowship a couple years ago, I thought it was a very fitting opportunity for me because I grew up in a very political family. Um, you know, I grew up, I was raised in Jamaica, and I think almost everyone in Jamaica can say that their family was a very political family. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is that everybody in Jamaica wears their politics on their sleeves, and I mean that quite literally. Um, we have two distinct parties and two distinct colors. So the months leading up to election, you're exclusively wearing the color of your party. You're either wearing green for the Jamaica Labor Party, or you're wearing orange for the People's National Party. My father uh, was a lifelong member of the People's National Party, and it was a running joke in my family that growing up, even as a small child, I could not wear the color green. <laughs> um, even today, I can't wear the color green. Um, and I share this story because, you know, my father raised me with a strong foundation that government can work if the right people are in charge. And we, and we sort of embody this in our society through wearing our colors, through talking to neighbors and friends about politics. And politics was never something that we couldn't talk about. And politicians never violated common sort of like rules of, of human decency. In doing the Buckles Fellowship, I was reminded of all this because at the core of this experience is a sentiment that an investment in the civic, future civic leaders of our city is needed now more than ever. My fellow cohort members and I got to immerse ourselves in an experience that deepened our knowledge of policies at the state and city level. We got an opportunity to be active board members of the Committee of 70 and were paired with a Committee of 70 board member for the duration of the fellowship. Now this is a perfect opportunity for me to give a special shout out to my mentor who I know is in the room today, Laura LaRosa. Uh, Laura embodies, claps for Laura, absolutely. <laughs> um, Laura embodies what it means to be a thoughtful mentor. She is generous with her time and selfless in her approach to helping others, and I'm honored to have been a beneficiary of that thoughtfulness. I assume that everyone in this room supports the Committee of 70 because in spite of our own political affiliation, we still believe in respectful political discourse and the role of an ineffective government, especially meeting the needs of our society's most marginalized. Meeting those needs not only take effective leaders, but for me, it also rests strongly on our society's ability to educate all children. Um, and that is something we're not doing a good job at right now. Um, that is the reason why a school like Chris Array Philadelphia High School exists, and why many businesses represented in this room are partners of our school through our work study program, and now the Committee of 70 is a job partner as well. We're at an interesting crossroads in our city, and despite our failings, there's still tremendous potential to correct course. 
We can do that by doubling down on education, doubling down on civics education, and hopefully everyone in this room is thinking to themselves, how can I use my power to invest in the next wave of leaders, the next wave of dreamers and innovators who will continue to inch us closer and closer to that more perfect union? Thank you to Karen Buckles, who in creating the Buckles Fellowship in honor of her late husband, Carl Buckles, is doing just that. Before I go, I'd like to thank my fellow cohort members, who many of them are here today. Um, Adam, Eric, Maria, Sandy, Tim, we have two Toms, so Tom Young and Tom Levy. Um, the eight of us share a pretty special bond, and I'm honored to know them and to now call them friends. And thank you all for having me. <laughs> Um, now it's my honor to introduce the next speaker. The Buckles Fellowship was in part created to make sure Philadelphia has a strong pipeline of leaders to follow in the footsteps of those business and civic leaders currently at the Elm. Our presenting sponsor, Brandywine Realty Trust, and its senior vice president and C70 policy committee co-chair, George Hasenich, certainly serves as a model to emulate. <laughs> Mr. Asenich has been with Brandywine since 2009. During his tenure, Brandywine has grown into one of the largest publicly traded, full service, integral real estate companies in the United States. Mr. Hasenich is a civic leader in Philadelphia and beyond who serves on several boards and supports numerous civic initiatives and nonprofit organizations. We're grateful for his support and would like to welcome him to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the work of Committee of 70 and its mission are immensely important and essential to the continued growth of Philadelphia. I'm honored to be speaking here this evening on behalf of Brandywine for the 118th anniversary event. It's been a challenging few years, and this year has been no exception, is no exception. From trying economic times, public safety concerns, to human rights and environmental issues. It's more important now than ever that we continue to use our voice to advocate for solutions and contribute to a more effective government at every level. As a result of these challenges, this, this year's election was dynamic, both educational and engaging as well. As it was also deflating and contentious, raising strong feelings, no matter your stance or belief. While I can't say I'm sorry to see it come to an end, I am proud of our, I'm thinking of all the election ads right now, which I'm sure everyone is kind of going through everyone's head. So I'm proud of how our communities, our city, and our nation turned out to vote. People truly understood how impactful their individual voice can be in shaping public policy, and they acted. My hope for these new leaders is that we see real measurable change in action where it matters most. We need leaders who can address these issues head on and ensure that we build a future that we can all be proud of. And while government leadership may be top of mind tonight, these ideals transcend politicians. It also applies to leadership in business, in community, and in advocacy. We are stronger together, and when we unite, we can make a change. Committee of 70 has created an ideal platform and safe space for public discourse and action so that we can advocate for good governance, transparent policy, and disciplined allocation of public resources. These efforts help create outcomes that support Philadelphia, making Philadelphia an ideal place to live, work, play, and thrive. Brandywine Realty Trust has, has been a long, proud sponsor of the Committee of 70, not just for its mission, but because we share similar values. The committee's work takes grit, persistence, and passion. All of us here tonight understand that true change goes beyond any sort of single piece of legislation, but rather the message, the tone, and the action set by our political leaders is what yields the most impactful, positive influence and outcomes. Through Brandywine's work as developers, we have, we have the pleasure of working in communities of all kinds throughout the region 
as, and beyond. We believe that how we develop is more important than what we develop. And that work we do in partnership with civic and local leaders can shape neighborhoods and impact the lives of so many families. Like our buildings, it's up to us to make sure that our impact on communities we serve is a positive one that benefits generations to come. We do this through volunteering, and I can honestly say we actually had a community day today where a bunch of us were out there for several hours cleaning up lots in West Philadelphia. And so if I, if I seem a little like I'm about to doze off or something like that, it's because I'm really tired, really old from doing that kind of manual labor. So we do this through volunteering. We create paths to, to family-sustaining jobs and career development, investing in community programs, funding early-stage minority-owned businesses, and more to ensure economic and social equity, equality, and prosperity. As I stand here, I'm honored to look out into a room with so many people who share the similar set of values and a commitment to create a better tomorrow. We thank the Committee of 70 for fostering this community of leaders so we can all work together to rise above the challenges and shape a better tomorrow. We now have a short video, which I hope you'll enjoy, and thank you. We are fueled by a passion for quality, integrity, innovation, and community. A commitment to thinking big, diving deep, and delivering results. We are partners, neighbors, trailblazers. Owning, leasing, developing, and managing hundreds of properties and millions of square feet nationwide. We are always looking toward the future. We know the value in what we do lies in the difference we can make. We are Brandywine Realty Trust. Thank you, George and Brandywine, uh, our presenting sponsor of our event this evening. I'm Al Schmidt. I'm the president and CEO of the Committee of 70. And I especially want to thank Eric Kreitler, our chairman, for his leadership and friendship over the years during this challenging time for our democracy. And I also want to thank you, um, our sponsors, our guests, our supporters, and especially our board members. It's because of you that 70 has raised more at this annual event than at any other annual event in its history. And also with the significant support of foundations, a number of them, 70 has raised more this year than ever before in its nearly 120 year history. And it's an important time to do that. It's not just really about dollars, it's about funding our efforts to strengthen and support democracy um, during this challenging time. And I know that because as our team will surely complain, I spent all afternoon going back through our records from 1904 to present to see how much Committee of 70 raised every year and adjust it by inflation to make sure that that was an accurate statement to say. Um, uh, I was a former federal auditor for the, for the government and also as an ele election administrator, it's important that everything we say is true. And that is true. Because everyone involved in democracy and elections ought to only say things that are true. And our nearly 120 years of our history have led up to this critical moment in time. This year, 70 has expanded our signature voter engagement program, We Vote, statewide, reaching hundreds of thousands 
of Pennsylvania voters uh, with a world-class, nonpartisan, non-political resources. This program maximizes 70s historically strong ties to the business community and underscores the importance that business leaders can and must play in strengthening and safeguarding our democracy. Our work and success in this area is why our featured speaker and renowned investor and philanthropist, David Rumenstein, is going to join us this evening, and we're very fortunate for that. And I also want to thank our board member, Elizabeth Vale, for hard work and enthusiasm in making this possible. Instead of reciting David Rubenstein's extraordinary biography um, that you'll find in your program, I just want to highlight his remarkable gener generosity and unwavering dedication to the American experiment. Not to mention his ex uh, success as an author and television host and all the reasons why we wanted to bring his perspective and experience here this evening. We're also very fortunate to have Ellie Velshi guide us in what is sure to be a fascinating conversation. When thinking about who would be the perfect person to lead it, we knew that Ali was the right person for that job because of his years of business and economic reporting, his coverage of major news events and threats to democracy a home and abroad, and his connection to an investment in the civic life of Philadelphia. We are so grateful to have you both. So take it away, gentlemen. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. David, good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, I just want to, for, most of you know Al Schmidt, but for, I know there are a number of young people in here, uh, some students included. And if you're not from the Philadelphia area, just make sure you Google him and understand that, I mean, this is an august hall, and I don't like to use bad language, but back in that 2020 election, there was a lot of bullshit. And people like Al around the country stood up to that. And that sounds, David, it sounds simple, but just like when telling the story about what happened at Independence Hall uh, all those years ago, it's not simple. When there are people bearing down on you, people in power bearing down on you, people in politics bearing down on you, it's easy to stand up for democracy when you have nothing at stake, when you're not going to lose anything. But Al was going to lose something, and he still stood up for democracy. And that's, that's the, the framing around why we're here, David. And I want to ask you, because you, 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 normally when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm the, I'm the best interviewer in the pair, but that's not the case here. Um, David, you, I, I want to just take your hat as a, as a student of history. You're one of the very few owners in the world of the, a copy of the Magna Carta. You really understand history. So where are we in this moment, in Constitution Hall, sitting underneath the, the First Amendment, blocks from Independence Hall, at a moment where there are many Americans who, certainly two weeks ago, but still today, think that there is an existential threat to democracy here and in the world. You've, had a, you've got 800 years of perspective on this stuff because of what you do and what you've studied. Where do you think we are? Position us. Well, I'm not sure I can completely answer that question. Uh, uh, in the fully, amount of time we've got. But. Uh, I do like to remind people that the country had bigger problems uh, during the time of the Civil War. We, were, uh, we killed 3% of the population, and members of Congress were being hit by other members of Congress on the floor of the Congress. So we have, we're not doing that yet, uh, hopefully not going to happen again. But since the Civil War, 
And we've had challenges to our democracy during uh, the, Teddy, uh, the Franklin Roosevelt administration. Many people questioned whether our system could survive. It did. And we've had challenges throughout the years, uh, and clearly the racial challenges that we've seen over the recent decades, and maybe longer than that, you could say, um, have clearly made the country split down the middle in certain areas. But I think nothing uh, in recent times has split the country in quite the way that the events of January 6th did and all the election events uh, associated with it. I, am, I dedicated my uh, book on American Experiment to the, the judges and the federal uh, and the civil servants, federal and state, who protected our democracy because it wasn't a clear ca case that all those cases would be thrown out. There were 65 cases filed and 65 cases were thrown out. And many of those judges were people who um, were vilified for, for throwing those cases out, as were election officials. So I think today, the events of the last election, I think, made people feel that maybe we're trying to right the ship and maybe we are, because it seems as if most of the so-called election deniers lost. Most of the election officials, and maybe all of the election officials who were running for various election-related offices who were election deniers lost. And there seemed to be some semblance of normality coming back to uh, the democracy that we have. Remember, when the democracy was created, it was not a democracy that anybody really thought, or many people thought, would live very long. Uh, Benjamin Franklin's famous comment, a republic if you can keep it, uh, was probably the sentiment of most of the people at that constitutional convention. Thomas Jefferson, who wasn't at the Constitutional Convention, thought it would last maybe 20 years, and he didn't, I mean, it wasn't clear he wanted it to last more than 20 years. Many people, no one there would have thought it would last this long. And when you think about it, the Constitution uh, is an incredible document. It was drafted by 57 white Christian property-owning men. There were no women, no minorities, no Jews, no Muslims, and no poor people. And that, that we have at this document still uh, as our guiding uh, operating uh, set of principles is amazing with only 27 amendments um, and 17 if you don't count the Bill of Rights. So it is amazing that what these people came up with who don't really represent all of us in many ways uh, is still in existence. It was clearly in many ways a work of genius. Today I've often want, wondered Suppose there was a new Constitutional Convention, as you all probably know, under our Constitution, we can have a new Constitutional Convention. You can amend the Constitution with uh, two-thirds of the, the votes of each House and three-quarters of the states, or a con new Constitutional Convention. So how do you think the Constitution would be different if we had a new set of 57 people, it was including women, minorities, Jews, Muslims, other religions, uh, what would, how would the government be different? I don't know. Um, I don't know that I want to know either because I'm not sure it would be that much better than what we have. But it is amazing that this document has lasted so long and we take it so sincerely. Now, the events that we've seen in, in, in the election and the election denial and so forth, that upset so many people because we, we take so seriously the elections process in this country and we take so seriously the Constitution. There is no other country in the world where the government officials swear an allegiance to a document as opposed to, let's say, a leader. No other government in the world, not even England, no other place. They swear allegiance to maybe the queen or the king or a government official, but not to a document. It is amazing when we swear our leaders in, they take an, uh, an oath to the, doc, the Constitution. And again, this is a document that, you know, you would think uh, isn't one that would be perfect in the sense that it was drafted by these uh, very elite set, set of people. You uh, put on a different hat as a business leader. One of the things that's happened in the last few years, particularly in what some people see to be the failings of our democracy, maybe the failings of 57 white men, who knows? But where they have seen democracy not feel perfect, we have seen people turn to business leaders, and some of those business leaders rise to the occasion to say, we're going to take a stand about investment in a particular uh, state or region, or about uh, contributions to particular political candidates or political parties. Uh, as a business leader, do you think that's a good thing to do? Well, again, back to the Constitutional Convention. Who would be at the Constitutional Convention if we had another one? Would it be only elected officials? Well, how many people here would like to see only a current elected officials be in a Constitutional Convention? Um, so who would you want to have? Well, presumably you'd like to have university leaders, foundation leaders, uh, people that care about uh, democracy, and people who are um, maybe in the business world. It's not terrible to be a business person, 
And I think business people actually have some good judgments from time to time, and they have to balance complicated issues. So the business community has historically not been a uh, bastion of courage. Business leaders, by and large, what they want to do, by and large, with obvious exceptions, what they want to do is make the company as profitable as they can, consistent with the laws and so forth. Now, in recent years, many business leaders, maybe because there's a lack of leadership from elected, elected officials in some cases, because they're stymied for a lot of other reasons I can describe, business leaders are saying, maybe we should speak out. And recently, a number of business leaders have spoken out on the uh, election den uh, denial kind of efforts been in certain, certain states, and I think I applaud them for doing that. I think uh, business leaders probably have a responsibility not only to their shareholders, but to the, the community, and I think business leaders should be more active in giving their views not on every single issue, but on ones where they can productively add something to the discussion. What drives that? Is it going to be shareholder value? Is it going to be a 3.5% unemployment rate where people choose where they, gonna, where they want to work because of the values of the company? What drives these leaders? Some of them are just altruistic. They, they have, hold these beliefs. But how do we get there? Well, some business leaders obviously are doing what they think is going to be probably politically popular. I mean, um, you know, if you are running a company based in, let's say, Philadelphia, um, and you say, I don't think that the, the, the laws in Texas are very fair in terms of providing uh, access to the ballot box, it's probably not going to be that politically damaging to that business leader. Uh, I suspect, though, of course, we've learned that sometimes if you are, let's say, the CEO of Disney, and you say something that you think might be politically appropriate for uh, your constituents, and it's in the state of Florida, you can ultimately be punished for it, and, and that CEO, not because of that alone, maybe lost his job uh, the other day. Um, I, I think business leaders are not necessarily um, the people with uh, the courage to stand up to every single um, uh, group in, uh, that comes along and says, you should take this position or take that position. By and large, business leaders would prefer to not do that. But in some cases that are existential to democracy, I think they, they have been willing to do it, and I, I applaud them for doing that. One of the reasons why they become so disproportionately important today is because of the amount of money it takes to run an election and the degree to which yes. members of Congress in particular uh, do not spend the time they use. I used to work for Lee Hamilton of Indiana. And, and back in the day, uh, members of Congress, uh, you know, would hang out with each other, just ir irrespective right. of their political party. Sometimes they would house together. That doesn't happen anymore. Well, Lee they Hamilton is the kind other. of person who would, be, would have been a great person to, to have be a founding father yes. uh, or to be a, in the Constitutional Convention. Let me explain why money is really the, the uh, worst thing going on in our democracy right now. I know uh, because of Citizens United, there's no limit to essentially what you can give. In the old, old days, you could give $1,000. Um, and that was a limit, maybe 2000 for a couple. Now, there's no limits. And essentially, we don't like to call it bribery because we're not a banana republic. But if you're giving millions of dollars to a candidate, why are you doing that? Now, some cases, people have altruistic views, but in some cases, people really want access. And that's the way we do it in this country. Why do members of Congress need to raise so much money? Well, there are four reasons. Number one, Whoever has the most money in the bank account will probably scare away uh, many people to run against them. Number two, generally, not always, the person who has the most money will win. Number three, you can use that money now to help buy subcommittee and committee chairmanships because it used to be that everything was by seniority, but it's not seniority anymore. So if you've given a contribution to somebody and for his or her election, they'll probably remember you when you come along and say, I'd like to be the subcommittee chairman and you have a vote. And fourth, you can keep the money. Now, it used to be the case, you can keep the money, and when you left Congress, you could do anything you want with it. Now we've, quote, limited it so you can only use it for political purposes. But if you want to hire your child to be your political campaign manager, or you want to hire your, or, or rent your house as a campaign headquarters, you can do that under our laws. So members of Congress love to raise money because in the end they think it'll benefit them. And now they spend, members of the House spend about 40% of their time raising money. They can't do it from the House office building, so they go next door to another building, and they dial for dollars, as they call it. And members of Congress are obsessed with it because they think that it'll be beneficial to them. And sadly, you don't raise money from people right down the middle. You raise people money from people on the left, far left, or the far right. That's where the money is coming from. And therefore, members of Congress, as you suggest, don't really know each other so much anymore. Um, there, there, are no, there used to be that congressional delegations would go overseas on what was called junkets. Because the publicity was so bad, they don't have many junkets anymore. Secondly, it used to be the case that members of Congress had 
conference committees where the House and the Senate would work things out, but there's no legislation anymore except you know, a, a debt limit bill or, or appropriation bills, and everything is worked out of the leadership offices. There's no need for a conference committee, so members of Congress and the House and Senate don't get to work with each other very much. I tried to combat this a bit by setting a, 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 a program a, a seven years ago where I interview a, a great historian in front of members of Congress only. And it's a free dinner that I host for members of Congress on the theory that they should know more about our history than anybody else since they're making the laws. And members of Congress come in great droves. Why? Because they actually would like to be talking to people in the opposite party, in the opposite house, but they don't want the press to see them, so there's no press there. And so they can do it in a social context. But they don't really uh, socialize with much anymore. And if you're seen with, uh, with members of the opposite party on a regular basis, you'll be criticized. And that's why you don't have very much bipartisan legislation anymore. It's, it's a sad situation, and I, it's not going to change as long as money is as important as it is. So you are discussing something that we discuss here at the Constitution Center, and that is this idea of respectful dialogue, the idea uh, of, of how our system was built so that the passions would be slowed. That's, of course, being undone by social media now. But how much of that would solve the problem? Let's say we went back to those days where members of Congress talked to each other, they didn't have to spend as much time fundraising, and they got to know each other. Would that solve where we are in polarization? Because we're polarized now because of media, we're polarized because of social media, the world is polarized. Well, as a general view, um, people have a harder time hating people they know reasonably well. As a general view, some, obviously you may, some of you may hate people that you know very well. Um, but, <laughs> but as a general rule, when you spend time with people, you probably are gonna understand them better. When there was uh, more men members coming together more, there was much more bipartisan legislation. And until the uh, Affordable Care Act, any major piece of social legislation in the United States that was passed by Congress was bipartisan. Social Security Act is a good example, Medicare and so forth. Um, civil rights legislation was all um, bipartisan. Now we don't have that anymore. And, and you have, you know, think about it, the Affordable Care Act was only passed by one vote in the House, really. And, and so, but we now accept it as a law of the land, and, and I'm happy we do that. But uh, it is amazing how... Uh, lacking in bipartisanship, we, we, we really are. And I would say one of the problems members of Congress have, I haven't addressed it, doesn't quite fit with this, but we haven't had, a, members of Congress haven't had a salary increase for maybe 15 years or so. There was a mechanism for them to get it automatically, but then some members didn't want the automatic increase, so they didn't get it. So now we have 75 to 80 members of the House living in their offices because they can't afford a second apartment in Washington. And, you know, it's not a great way to run a government. And, and as you also suggest, many of the members of Congress, because they don't have a lot of money, they, they basically, um, they go home every weekend. They don't have a house in Washington for weekends, and so they don't want to stay in their offices over the weekend. So they go home, their kids are there, families there, but they're not really staying in Washington, socializing in Washington with people anymore. It's just it's not a great situation, not a great way to run, run the country. So you, you've, you've studied, invested, and spent a great deal of your own money on democracy itself. In this building, we do that. There are a lot of, probably everybody in the audience here is deeply acquainted with democracy. But I remember when I started leaning into this a few years ago, uh, having a conversation with a colleague who said, it's meaningful, but it's a little bit boring. Um, people are not going to go out and vote for the preservation of democracy. They don't fundamentally think the failure of democracy is existential to America. It seems that needle has moved a little bit. Is the failure of democracy the biggest issue? For half of Americans, it turned out to be. Well, in, in the most place. recent election, I was amazed that I saw people on television who were standing in line seven hours to vote. How many of you would stand in line seven hours to vote? Maybe some of you have. Okay, there's somebody who did, or maybe would. But, you know, think about it. People do, are committed to democracy when you're standing in line that, that long to vote. Um, you know, most of us probably mail in a mail-in ballot or maybe it doesn't take that long to vote. Seven hours is a long time. Eight hours, five hours, a long time. I think people do treasure um, the right to vote, and we, we don't vote in as high a percentage as other countries, for sure. Uh, but this most recent election, we did have a fair number of, of people voting compared to what you normally get in an off-year election, much higher than normally we get. But in, generally, in a presidential election, you'll probably get 60-some percent of eligible voters voting, not 100%. In some democracies, you get 90, 95% voting. Uh, maybe there's some financial incentives to vote, but we don't provide that. I, I wish people would vote more, but there's no doubt that people treasure the right to vote, and many people will, will do whatever they can to vote, and uh, I, I think that's a good thing. I, I, I do, I, I'm glad that we're increasingly educating people about democracy in this sense, that, um, we don't know, as we talked earlier, much about history and civics anymore. 
Uh, right now, we don't teach history and civics as much in schools as we used to. And as a result, you find these kind of statistics that I'll cite to you, and maybe some of you have heard them before. Anybody here a naturalized American? Is there any naturalized American in the audience? Anybody? Okay, one, two, couple. Yeah. One right here. All right. So to be a naturalized American, you have to take a citizenship test. There are 50 million immigrants in this country, and probably 60%, 70% of them are actually citizens. Not everyone is. But of the citizens, uh, those who've taken the citizenship test, it's, it's 100 questions, 100 potential questions. You have to actually answer 10 of them, and you have to get six of them correct. 91% of the people that take that test pass, 91%, which means that they know how many branches of government we have. Uh, many people in the United States, when asked them, more than a majority of Americans are asked on the street, how many branches the federal government have do not get the answer right. So, but 91% of the people who want to be citizens take that test and 91% pass. The same test was given not long ago, a couple years ago, to citizens in all 50 states. So about two or a half million people took the test and they were asked, the same basic questions that the, the, that the foreign citizen applicants have, were, were, were asked. And in 49 out of 50 states, a majority of citizens born in this country couldn't pass the basic citizenship test. Now, only one state, Vermont, with a bare majority, 53% able to pass. Which is essentially Canada. Right. <laughs> so, um, so it is interesting that Americans don't know as much as they should. Now, the theory that the Founding Fathers came up with uh, down the road was basically this, that if you have an informed citizenry, you'll have a reasonable democracy. Now, they didn't completely trust Americans, so they didn't let Americans vote directly for president. They didn't let Americans vote directly for the, for the Senate. And, and the House of Representatives, they could vote, but not everybody was allowed to vote. You had to have property, you had to be Christian, and so forth. But, in other, but basically, they gave some uh, a sense that people should allow, be allowed to vote, but they wanted people to be informed. And their theory and their hope was that ultimately people would be informed enough so that at some point people could vote for the Senate and the President directly, but we obviously haven't gotten to the presidential direction, uh, election directly. But the theory behind um, in the democracy, representative democracy, is an informed citizenry. And we have to have an informed citizenry, and sometimes we don't have it, sadly. And, and I can see why it's difficult for our uh, leaders around the world, people who are who represent us, our State Department, other our ambassadors, how they have a hard time in recent years saying to other countries, you should use, you should have democracy. Look how wonderful it's working in our country. Because they, people can look at our country and they can see the flaws in it. And we, we need to fix our own dem democratic system, make it work better, make sure we have more informed citizens before we can really tell everybody around the world how to run their country. So an informed citizenry, uh, if, you, if you look at the damage to an informed citizenry over the years, some of it is the failure in public education, the failure to teach civics, some of it is the, uh, the, the field I'm in, uh, cable news. Perhaps we went down that road of pushing people into their own thought bubbles. Um, Roger McNamee uh, writes about social media saying it's incompatible with democracy. Give me your take on social media. It's, it's yet another hot topic. Your former president is about to be back on Twitter. Um, I was your former president, too. So. Um. <laughs> Um, well, I, I am not on social media, and the reason is, I, uh, I have a couple reasons. One, when Mark Zuckerberg was at Harvard and starting this company, uh, my daughter was a student there, and my now son-in-law was a student there and was, was his classmate and knew him from high school as well. And they asked me to invest, and I said, look, this is a dating service. It's never going to go anywhere. And so I didn't invest. And ever since then, I've, I've had a kind of maybe a bias against social media because I didn't invest. But... <laughs> I'm also don't on social media because I don't want to read that Kim Kardashian has 170 million followers and I have six followers. So I'm always afraid that somebody will say, well, David Rubenstein has six followers and Kim Kardashian has 173 million. So I, I, maybe that's why I'm not on social media. But social media obviously is the, uh, the currency for younger people and obviously it's the currency for many, many in, uh, more, more people than, than we could have imagined. Who would have imagined that Twitter would produce the kind of impact that it's had? I, I, I don't want to be... Uh, um, seem like I'm an um, old fogey who says we shouldn't have this. I think there's some benefits to it. it, it instant communication, instant access to other people's views. I, I just think we, we should probably have some more constraints in what people are allowed to say, and, and we should have more um, kind of rules that the government kind of buys into about who's allowed to be on these things and say what. Because right now, uh, you can sometimes have the big lie. Under, uh, when, when Adolf Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, 
he described the big lie. And what he said was, if you say something that's not true and it's ridiculous, repeat it over and over again, because the more ridiculous it is, and you repeat it over and over again, people will say, well, nobody would say that unless it was true. You couldn't say something so ridiculous unless it was true, so it must be true. And so, to some extent, when you repeat things over and over again, even if you know they're not true, they will have resonance, and social media allows people to have resonance with some of these issues, which are clearly, in my view, uh, not, not accurate, not fair. You want to talk, I want to talk to you about philanthropy because this is a big part of what you do. You are, you've always been a big giver. As you have acquired more wealth, you have shared more wealth. Um, and, and you are a, a, a member of a group that has pledged to give away a, a great deal of their wealth. Uh, tell me about that thought process. Tell me how your kids feel well, about it and what, you're gonna, what, 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 yes. what you've done so far. Okay, so I'd like to remind people that philanthropy is derived from an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. And you can love humanity by giving the most valuable thing you have, which is your time. Um, time is more valuable than anything. You, you can always make more money. You can always, if you're inclined to make money, you can make more money. It's not that difficult if you're in that business and you want to make more money. But you, don't, you can't make more time. And so I think when you give your time, like, let's say the young woman who, did, who, who started Teach for America, she came up with a good idea and did, I think, a really good philanthropic thing with Teach for America. And so I encourage people to do that. And, and Americans are great at volunteering. When de Tocqueville came here in the 1830s, he said, I have a hard time getting people to talk to me. They're all busy volunteering. I can never get them to sit down and talk to me because America has a tradition of volunteering and giving back. So in my case, on the, on the non-volunteering part, um, I grew up in modest circumstances. My father was a, uh, a postal worker. He didn't, have a high, he didn't graduate from high school, nor did my mother. And so, you know, we grew up in a very modest uh, means. Uh, in hindsight, it was a great situation because when you grow up in a wealthy family, it's, it's a little more challenging. The hardest thing, as you all know, who are parents, is to raise children. That's the hardest thing in life, is to raise healthy and happy children. If you are wealthy, it's a little bit more challenging, even though people can make fun about that. But obviously, you have, it's so much easier to spoil your children. I wasn't spoiled because I didn't have a lot of money. And so when I finally made money, I said, okay, with my last name and with my background, I probably wouldn't have been able to do this in other countries. So I want to give back to the country. And I want to do it in ways that I, are meaningful. I, I don't have the wealth of Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, so I can't solve all, their, all the problems that they're trying to tackle. But I wanted to do things in my own way. And my standards are start something that otherwise wouldn't get started, finish something that otherwise wouldn't get finished, have an intellectual interest in it so I'll stay engaged and not just write a check, and I want to see some progress in my lifetime. And most of my money goes to scholarships and medical research and education-related things and cultural kinds of uh, institutions, but a lot of it also goes to what I call patriotic philanthropy, which is a misleading kind of thing because uh, all philanthropy is probably patriotic. I, I coined that phrase in about two seconds once in, off the top of my head, and it really means things where... I'm trying to remind people the history and heritage of our country on the theory that if you remind people the history and heritage of your country, they'll be more informed as a citizen. And let me explain what I mean. What is the value of preserving the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence? I think I own more copies of the Declaration of Independence than anybody in this country. I, I've been obsessively buying them and putting them on display all over the, 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 the country. In fact, I, one of my copies is here. And I, I want people to see these documents. Why, why, why is it so important to see documents? We know what the language of the Declaration of Independence is. Why do we need to preserve the document? We just know what's in it. We just read it on a computer slide. Because the human brain has not yet evolved to the point where seeing an original document is the same as seeing on a computer slide the words. So if you're going to see the original document, of original copy of the Declaration of Independence, and you're coming here, more likely than not, you're going to be reading about it before you get here. And more likely than not, when you get here, you're going to have a curator tell you about it. And more likely than not, when you go home, you're going to read about it. And therefore, you'll become more informed as a citizen. So what I'm trying to do is preserve documents or, or buildings so people can learn more about our history. And I think I have an obligation to do it because I got very lucky in this country, as all of us did. And I'd like all of you to think about, you know, if you're here today, you obviously are patriotic Americans and you care about our country. But what more can you do today or the rest of your uh, you know, life to kind of promote democracy more than you've already done. Think about, is there anything you could do to do more than you've already done? Everybody here, presumably, has already done something, but everybody can do a little bit more. I can do a little bit more. And also, when you do something more, you are a role model for your own children and your grandchildren. And in my own case, I, my children are not yet at the point where they're as interested in some of these subjects as I am, 
but I hope eventually they will be, and maybe my being a role model for them will help them do it, and you can be the same, or being a role model for your friends, your children, your grandchildren, and everybody can probably do a little bit more, and I think when you do something in philanthropy, you don't have to do it by writing a check. You can give your time and your, and your ideas and your energy, and that's more valuable, in my view, than actually writing a check. Uh, Elizabeth or somebody, given I can talk for hours, so somebody should give us a cue when it's time for us to wrap up. But you just said something very interesting, because uh, we really could just keep talking. Um, you said, I got very lucky in this country. And you've talked about your luck in the past. And I suppose that's the right thing to do when you're as successful as you are, because the opposite would sound a little haughty, right? That I'm, I've done that well because I'm smarter than everyone else or I'm really good right. with money. But you've explained luck differently than I've thought about luck. You're, you're not saying just by chance you got lucky. You have a fairly textured explanation for what luck looks like, which sounds a lot more like opportunity and hard work. Well, I think you make your own luck. Let's suppose um, you sit in your office all day you, and you're sitting in your home all day and you never go out and you never meet anybody and, and uh, as a result you don't have contacts and so forth. You might not get luck. In my case, for example, I met a few people who helped me start my investment firm. And had I not met them because of certain, ser certain serendipitous relationships, I wouldn't have started the firm. And, and when I got involved in philanthropy, it was serendipity. For example, the Magna Carta. When I bought the Magna Carta, it was some, you know, to show you investment bankers can do good things, an investment banker invited me to go view the Magna Carta. Had I not read that invitation, I probably wouldn't have bought the Magna Carta. I didn't have an obsessive compulsive desire. That happens to me the all Magna the time. Carta. So, <laughs> so, I, so I think, it, you know, you can make your own luck, and I think... Um, you know, you, you, people who are lucky make their own luck to some extent. You, you know, maybe you're fortuitous if you're born into a good family. Maybe you can say that's lucky. But generally, I think you can make your own luck by reaching out, having experiences, and trying to think about what you can do to make your life valuable. And I, as I get older, um, I'm now, and interestingly, I, I'm now 73 years old. Uh, when I worked in the White House for Jimmy Carter, I said to him, President Carter, you have no chance of losing to Ronald Reagan. He's such an old man. He's 69 years old. Nobody that old can get out of bed in the morning. I'm now four years older than Ronald Reagan was. And I, I, I also think, I remember when, when President Kennedy was elected. All of you probably remember uh, his father, who was the wealthiest man in the country, one of them. He was, seemed like an old, old man to me. Well, how old was Joe Kennedy? 71. 71. He's a teenager right now compared to me. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I just think that, you know, in the remaining years that I have on the face of the earth, I am trying to, you know, use the time to give back to society and, and do it in a useful way. And I, I call what I'm doing sprinting to the finish line because nobody knows how long you're going to be able to live. And when my parents were, when I was living at home with my parents when I was a kid, they always would read the obituary pages. I'd say, why are you reading that? And now I know. Um, I read the obituary pages all the time to see how many people or my age died or younger than me, and I'm saying, how did I get to be so lucky I'm still alive? So you only have a, you know, at some point your brain is going to not probably work so well or your body's not going to work so well, and you don't know which is going to give out first or maybe they'll both give out first. So I'm trying to get as much done as I can before something doesn't work. So I call it sprinting to the finish line. And I encourage all of you as well to sprint to the finish line. Don't just say, I'm retired and I'm just going to take life easy. Try to do something useful for society, because all of us are on this face of the earth for a very short period of time, relatively speaking. Homo sapiens have been around 400,000 years. Our average life expectancy is 82 or 83, something like that. But you should try to say, what can I do that makes the world a slightly better place, or my neighborhood a slightly better place, or my state, or my city? And what can I do to influence my children or grandchildren or other people so that they will do something useful? And that's what civilization is all about, is trying to move forward progressively, and we can do that if people like us pitch in and try to do something that makes the world a slightly better place by giving back to society. And uh, if you don't really want to do that, do it for this reason, a selfish reason. My theory is that people that give back to society or help other people are happier. You don't see a lot of, um, and, and you're happier, you live longer. And so, you know, grumpy people don't live as long. Happy people live longer. And if that isn't enough for you, I have it on good authority that those people that give back to society um, have a special place in heaven reserved for them. Now, now, you might laugh about that, but why would you want to take a chance that I'm wrong? All right, Al is standing by, because we are yeah. going to wrap very shortly, but I want to just close on that. So Al's standing there, and we were talking in the beginning about how Al and people like him, particularly in the 2020 election and now in the 2022 election, stood by and did the right thing. And this is 
This is not unique to a political party. There were people in, in both political parties, major political parties, and many, many people who were apolitical who stood there and did the right thing. In, in elections administration, in governments, uh, I, I, I didn't know any secretaries of state prior to the 2020 election. I didn't think about them. They, they weren't relevant to what we did or local election administrators. You write in your book, um, uh, The American Experiment, about how the rule of law and democracy and these things are in our DNA. I have to ask you, given what we've seen in the last few years, is it great people like Al who, who decided to do the right thing? Are our institutions strong enough? How do we make sure it's both people and our institutions that will protect us and allow us to thrive in the next 100 years? Well, remember, Edmund Burke famously wrote, the biggest problem for democracy is that good people do nothing. And that, in effect, it's a kind of a bastardized version of, of that, what he said. But if good people do nothing, then the democracy will, will collapse. You have to have good people willing to stand up and tell truth to power. Very few people are willing to tell truth to power. But those people that tell powerful people the truth are people that are doing great things for society. And I think I applaud all those people that told truth to power and took and sometimes great personal risks. And, and, and there were death threats to many people um, who told truth to power and wanted to make sure that our democracy lived the way the founding fathers intended it, that people had the chance to vote and the, and the majority would, would prevail. And I, I think we, we really owe a lot, of people, a lot to people who stood up and said, no, this is not right. This was not a stolen election. There was no chance it was stolen. In fact, it was probably the fairest election we've ever had. So there have been stolen elections at some, some, sometimes in this country, but this one, the most recent presidential election, one, there was no evidence of it in my view. So I applaud all of you for what you've done to support this organization because, you know, organizations like this around the country are, are important because we have to stand up for democracy. If we don't stand up for democracy, who's going to do it? Who around the world is going to stand up for our democracy if we don't do it? And I, I think while our country has a lot of imperfections and we have lots of flaws, uh, there's no other country in the world that I think, a large country that is anything like it. We have 50 million people that have immigrated to this country. No other country in the world has anything close to that. How many people leave the country each year? A few thousand, maybe, and probably for tax-related reasons. Very few people leave the country because it's, uh, it's, 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 the democracy doesn't work as well as they would like. They would like it to be better, of course, but I think we all have an obligation to pitch in and make the country better so that, again, our children and grandchildren can live in a better society than the one we do. David, I've heard you speak many times, and I'm never not smarter for it, so thank you, thank you. for being with us thank tonight. You. Big round of applause for thank David Rubenstein. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Well done. Thank you so much, David and Ali. Um, and I also want to thank our team at Committee of 70. It was it would otherwise be a very difficult decision to leave public office, like you work really hard to raise a lot of money and meet a lot of voters and spend a lot of evenings in some church basement walking to t waiting to talk to like two or three people, and it's hard to get there, but it was an easy decision to leave to come to the Committee of 70, not just because of its mission, but especially because of its team. Um, Lauren Cristella, who uh, Eric mentioned earlier, who's responsible for organizing this event and every event, that we have had. Pat, Dan, Michelle, Justin, Paul, Tom, and all of our incredible volunteers. And I really wanna thank all of you for your support and all of those who are watching this event virtually as well. And while you can't join us, the rest of us are going to reconvene downstairs uh, for a drink and a conversation about how we can all do our part to strengthen our democracy here in Philadelphia. Thank you.